On April 21st, a mysterious fog will roll into the sleepy coastal California town of Antonio Bay. And with it will come the long-forgotten specter of the past, as unknowable as the sea and just as deadly. Debuting in 1980, John Carpenter's The Fog tells the tale of a ghostly encounter that threatens the lives of everyone in Antonio Bay on the town's 100th anniversary, leaving a desperate band of survivors to not only try and understand the apparition that threatens their lives, but survive against a threat that cannot be hurt, cannot be stopped, and cannot be satiated until its blood debt is paid. And now, as the ghostly crew of the Elizabeth Dane rolls into shore on a supernatural fog, a long-forgotten story from the past will threaten the future of everyone in its path. At the time of its release, The Fog came at a crossroads in the career of John Carpenter. After Halloween's massive success in 1978, Carpenter had quickly been solidified as one of the preeminent horror directors of his time, even if he himself didn't identify as solely a horror director. So in his return to feature films after making two television movies, Carpenter and producer Deborah Hill chose to bring another horror story to life, only with a focus on a more classical ghost story instead of the more modern slasher scares of Halloween. The Fog is Carpenter attempting to pivot from the style of horror he crystallized in his tale of Michael Myers, only to realize that the market he's releasing his new film into has been altered by his own actions, and is now unfriendly to his newest creation. So in the production of The Fog itself, we see Carpenter wrestling with his own legacy while still fairly early in his career. And while The Fog is considered one of Carpenter's more minor works, with the director himself not being fond of it due to its difficult production, it remains an intriguing look at a creator experimenting early in his career and bugging a trend that he himself had helped start. From its historical origins to its tonal shifting reshoots to its California gothic tone, The Fog exists as a fascinating experiment within the careers of Carpenter and Hill, and an example of classical horror colliding with modern scares. By 1980, the slasher boom was already well underway, with dozens of low-budget bloodfests hoping to capitalize on the trend solidified by Halloween. But while the fog generates some of its scares from brutal kills, it is not in the slightest a slasher movie. Instead, the fog is a ghost story, but instead of a haunted mansion or a traumatized individual, it's an entire town being plagued by the ghosts of the past over the course of a single day. In this, we see a movie that has little to do with the trends of its time, but must still find a way to be successful for a new type of horror audience. Carpenter has cited multiple inspirations for The Fog, with almost all of them rooted in either history or non-film horror. The cloud monsters of The Trollenberg Terror, a fog-filled visit to Stonehenge with Deborah Hill, EC Comics Ghost Stories, and the purposeful wreck and plundering of the ship known as The Frolic in 19th century California are all sources for the plot and structure of The Fog. With these influences in mind, we see how Carpenter moved away from the primeval terror of Halloween, which preyed on audiences' fears of domestic insecurity and the boogeyman, and instead embraced a more classical sense of horror. But like Halloween, Carpenter still sets his scary story within a modern sleepy town, this time the fictional coastal Antonio Bay. And much like Halloween, the threat faced in the fog is rooted in the town's past, which has been forgotten for the sake of its residents being able to carry on with their lives. While slasher scares often come from banal evil simply targeting whatever's in its way, the ghostly horror of the fog comes from a repressed, ugly history coming to light and demanding justice, even if it must be taken out on the heads of those who have nothing to do with the wrong that must be righted. And much like the plain-masked Michael Myers, the evil of the fog is a faceless, amorphous danger, with Carpenter and cinematographer Dean Cundey almost always obscuring the visages of the pirate revenants until the very end. 11.55, almost midnight. Enough time for one more story. By placing a campfire story at the start of the film, Carpenter lets the viewer in on the fact that what we're watching is a creepy old ghost story come to life. It's ancient, it's out of the past, and it's out of step with what we'd expect in a horror film from 1980. But instead of having us suddenly transported within the film being told and creating a meta-narrative, 
the old ghost story meant to scare kids comes true. Now the walls we've put up to keep ourselves from ever being too scared by a story are brought down. Because if a campfire tale can be true, what do we really know about the world? As Adrian Barbeau's DJ Stevie Wayne, Tom Atkins' Nick Castle, Jamie Lee Curtis's Elizabeth Solly, and Hal Holbrook's Father Malone each try to uncover the truth behind mysterious happenings in Antonio Bay, we see the past slowly come to light, and that the wreck of the ship known as the Elizabeth Dane 100 years ago is more than just a scary story. The sinking of the Dane was not only true, but far worse than the simple ghost story meant to send a chill down your spine. The truth is that the wreck was planned by the founders of Antonio Bay to prevent its leprosy afflicted owner from arriving and founding a leper colony in the area. After the murder, the ship's gold was taken to build the town and its church, founding the city on murder and exploitation. With this reveal, the fog uses its ghost to tell a story of America's violent past coming to light, the sins of the father being visited upon the son, and the question of whether there is anything that can ever be done to right these wrongs. I'm the sixth conspirator. I'm Father Malone. Take me. The Fog was shot in 1979 on a budget of around $900,000 on sets and on locations around Northern California, with Carpenter and Hill originally having very little on-screen violence throughout the film. However, once editing was underway, Carpenter was extremely unhappy with the finished production, stating, It was terrible. I had a movie that didn't work, and I knew it in my heart. As a result, Carpenter went back for reshoots to up the scare factor. <laughs> Add scenes of violence that he felt modern audiences would demand from the director of Halloween, with Hill noting the graphic gore of the recently released David Cronenberg film Scanners in particular setting a precedent, and create a more comprehensible story that he saw as lacking in the original 80 minute cut of the movie. Approximately one third of the finalized film comes from reshoots, with most up close scenes of gore, the reanimated corpse encounter, and the finale atop the lighthouse, all coming from additional photography. But most importantly, the opening ghost story by Mr. Macon was also part of the reshoots. Without actor John Hausman's opening campfire monologue and the eerie opening montage of all sorts of machinery coming to life at midnight, as the ghosts of the Elizabeth Dane quite literally take possession of Antonio Bay, the fog would feel somewhat formless and less clear in its classical ghost story intentions. The additional violence may make the fog competitive with its contemporaries in horror, but Carpenter and Cundy are more focused on the anticipation of death and the lingering stillness after the kill than the rending of flesh and bone. The result is that the fog remains more intent on suspense and dread than slasher horror. And as the luminous titular fog rolls in before the kill, the physicality of Antonio Bay is remade into a hazy dream. The forgotten legend of the Elizabeth Dane turns our modern unremarkable reality into swooning myth and luxurious terror. That same impulse to add more blood and gore to the fog would also inform Carpenter's approach to Halloween 2, and it was also the fog that forced the Halloween sequel into existence. When Carpenter decided to develop the fog for Embassy Pictures, Halloween producer Erwin Yablon sued head of Embassy Robert Ream, guaranteeing Yablon's production rights for Halloween 2 and essentially forcing Carpenter's hand into writing the sequel script. He wasn't happy about it. For the entire story of Halloween 2, watch my video on the sequel and its influence on the franchise. But suffice it to say that the specter of the fog hangs over Carpenter's filmography in more ways than one. While the budget for the fog would increase to $1.1 million due to reshoots, it was still a success upon release, grossing more than $21 million at the box office and giving Carpenter and Hill the cachet needed to continue their careers with Escape from New York. But Carpenter himself, famously brutal on both his own work and the film industry as a whole, was never satisfied with The Fog, stating that it's not one of my favorites of my own movies. It's okay. 
It's okay. Well, that's all right, John, but I'm the one writing this video. While the finished film has clear weaknesses, far too long to investigate the reason for the ghosts arriving, not enough time for the ghostly invasion, not enough personal connection between the ghosts of the Elizabeth Dane and the people of Antonio Bay outside of Father Malone, the fog remains an ode to classical, almost cozy horror. There's something sublimely creepy about a horror story that owes more to classic EC comics, infamous for being controversial enough to be banned by the Comics Code Authority at the time, but quaint enough to be a silly diversion today, then it owes to the slasher craze dominating horror at the time of its debut, like the pirate revenant suddenly lurching from out of the past. The fog being out of step with its contemporaries adds a timeless quality to its California gothic scares. As a filmmaker, John Carpenter is often connected to the modern age of horror and sci-fi, thanks to his influence on both genres via cult hits like The Thing and They Live. But Carpenter has always been clear that he himself was influenced by classic directors like Howard Hawks, and that the western genre in particular was an influence on many of his movies, even when he didn't work directly in the genre. While The Fog may not look like it on its surface, the film and much of Carpenter's early filmography are indebted to Alfred Hitchcock. Not only is Hitchcock's psychosexual proto-slasher psycho within the DNA of Halloween, but that film's usage of California gothic imagery, which juxtaposes poses sunny, open vistas with murder, loneliness, and mystery, along with the hazy, Bay Area obsessions of vertigo, inform the feel of the fog. To further connect those dots, Carpenter hired Janet Lee, star of Psycho and mother of Fog and Halloween star Jamie Lee Curtis, as a supporting character in the fog. Part of the horror of Carpenter's Halloween is that the relative tranquility of modern suburbia is violently disturbed by the personification of evil. Locked doors and shut windows can't truly keep out the terror lurking just outside your home, violating the peace instilled and agreed upon by everyday life. But the horror of the fog is found in the loneliness of existing in a wide, untamable world, and the wide open spaces, rolling hills, and vast sea surrounding Antonio Bay reinforce that notion. Carpenter and Cundy's use of anamorphic widescreen Panavision lenses help display that sense of scale on a small budget. As the fog rolls in, it seems never-ending, inescapable. The result is our human characters feeling smaller and weaker than ever in contrast to this unknowable, implacable threat. And each feels increasingly lonely as the living fog surrounds them, not only isolating them, but hiding a threat that they are essentially powerless to stop. Much of this is reinforced by the wide-open, unpopulated real-world locations in coastal Northern California chosen by Carpenter and Hill. Said Hill, Because we decided to shoot in these locations, the movie itself was less claustrophobic than I think Halloween was. We had a lot more daylight in the fog. There was the ocean. There was all kinds of fun things in it that we didn't have in the first film that we did. As a side note, Deborah Hill deserves more praise. She's a huge part of the script and ideas behind Halloween, the Fog, Halloween 2, and Escape from New York. And while she was Carpenter's girlfriend at the time of Halloween, they broke up and he married Adrian Barbeau, with Hill maintaining a professional relationship with the both of them on The Fog and beyond. And Hill went on to still have a successful career away from Carpenter, being one of the few women producers in Hollywood during the 80s and 90s. Respect, Deborah Hill. To bring the titular fog to life, the crew used heavy-duty fog machines, dry ice, real fog on location, filming in reverse for unnatural movements of the haze, and double photography that superimposed miniaturized replicas over real-life locations for supernatural fog movements. It's all wrapped in Carpenter's evocative score, with the director-composer's synth emulating a more understated piano instead of his more overt previous work. The occasional classical organ and droning synth create an even more haunting gothic sound texture. It all forms a more spaced out, creeping score that floats and surrounds like the fog itself. While it may be less well known than his work on Halloween or Escape from New York, Carpenter's fog score is easily one of his most evocative and moody. And while the fog is meant to primarily shock and unsettle us, its most chilling scares are the larger ideas it suggests. 
The ghosts of the Elizabeth Dane are specters of the past and the sea, and draw our attention to the insignificance of our lives within centuries of history, and our little influence over a sprawling world. Like floatsome consumed by the ocean, the crew of the Elizabeth Dane have been subsumed by time, rendered unto myth until spat back out onto the coast like a waterlogged body. And now, these revenants have come to claim a town seemingly set adrift by a tragedy a century before. The idea that these ghosts can only be at rest if six must die implies a type of cosmic balance that has no debt toward a sense of justice. In the end, much like a brutal stinger at the close of an EC comic, the toll must still be paid. But the world remains a cold and lonely place. And when the clock strikes midnight, who knows what might wash ashore? Thanks for watching today's video. I've made a lot of John Carpenter videos and I was really excited to finally get to talk about The Fog. I think it's one of his better movies, but despite that, it's one of his less discussed ones. And what's funny about the production of this video is that I already planned on releasing a video on April 21st, and it wasn't until I picked The Fog for that release date and rewatched the movie that I realized that the movie took place on also April 21st. Coincidence? Or maybe something supernatural? Probably just coincidence. Still, kind of funny. Hopefully watching this video inspired you to rewatch watch or watch The Fog for the first time, and also to revisit the career of John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. I'm a huge Carpenter fan, obviously, so this won't be the last time I talk about one of his movies. Let me know your thoughts on The Fog and your own thoughts on Carpenter movies in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you think. As always, thank you to my patrons for their continued support and making this video possible. At the time of this video's release, there will be several Patreon-exclusive reviews now available. Those include WandaVision, The Snyder Cut of Justice League, and Godzilla vs. Kong. And there will likely be a Falcon and Winter Soldier review coming soon. If you'd like access to those as well as early access to every video, it's only a dollar a month. As always, I hope that you're all taking care of yourselves, watching out for one another, and staying safe. See you again soon.